But without further ado, I'm really, really uh, delighted to bring in Jennifer Rankin, who is, uh, who is the Guardian's correspondent here in Brussels. Thanks so much for being with us, being with me today, uh, Jennifer. I really, really appreciate it. Um, Great to meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you wrote that piece about about von der Leyen and and, and her. I wonder if you can just give me an idea of what you think she's been like as a, you know a European Commission president. So Ursula von der Leyen, European Commission president now since twenty nineteen the first female president of the commission as well, I think is a very interesting figure and she's taken a very interesting approach to, to handling the commission, which is this really unusual organization by international standards. It's more than a civil service, but it's less than a government. So it is a, it's, a, it's a civil service with a political leadership and she is in charge of it, effectively enforcing laws uh, for, um, for, for 450 million Europeans. And she's taken much more, I think, of a role on the world stage than her predecessors. She is. Um, she came into office saying she wanted to lead a geopolitical commission. And then very soon afterwards, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. And that provided a test to show whether whether she was going to, to demonstrate her international credentials. I am um, by a lot by the reading of people inside the commission, even people who were rather critical of her, they think she got the big judgment call right on Ukraine, that she supported Ukraine and has led the EU through some historically tough standards, uh, sorry, historically tough sanctions against the Russian government and has, has shown leadership, uh, for example, in bringing Ukraine forward closer to Europe by ensuring Ukraine now has candidate status and begins the long, long path to EU membership. So I think on, on, the, on this issue, for example, she's, she's, she's gained a lot of credit as someone who is speaking for Europe. But of course, your, your program is about who is the real leader in Europe today. And I think we can say there isn't just one leader for, you, for Europe. And I, and I don't think for the foreseeable future there will be, not when you have 27 heads of state and government with very clear ideas, very clear agendas on, on what, they, what they want to do and where they want to position Europe in the world. So I don't think von der Leyen is, is going to, to speak for Europe, certainly. She'd, she'd certainly like to, though, wouldn't she? I mean, with Merkel, Merkel was considered the Queen of Europe, the former German Chancellor. Do you think von der Leyen sort of wants that role? Do you think that's what she's gunning for as Commission President? I think she certainly wants a big to be a player on the international stage, uh, as does Charles Michel at the at the European Council, um, and I think she's. You can see that she's successfully forged a better relationship with the U.S. president. Although you can also say, well, maybe that's not very hard, given that the the previous U.S. president Donald Trump, you know, to, to put it mildly, wasn't of course interested in in having a good relationship with the European Union, which was an organization, you know. A, uh, a group, uh, a grouping that he regarded with contempt. Uh, so I think she clearly von der Leyen wants to play a role on on the world stage, uh, but she's not alone in that. And and I think there are some of the Macron's visit to to Beijing with her showed some some clear differences in how she approaches China policy and how he approaches China policy. And you'll you'll find other views again among different member states. So I there's I think. The EU for the foreseeable future is going to is going to struggle to have a common line on lots of big foreign policy questions, and perhaps the biggest one of all at the moment on on China. What's your what's your read on the China trip? Did did Macron sort of shun her, take the limelight, and then make those comments about not following America on Taiwan? What, what what's your understanding of what's happened in this last week? Because he doubled down on those comments as well. He's 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 sort of said no, I stick by that. Europe needs to sort of speak for itself. Well, I mean, to some extent, a lot of what he said was very much what he's been saying for several years since he made that speech at the Sorbonne on how on on what Europe should be and how Europe should be independent, should be sovereign in the world, should be, um, you know, independent economically and, uh, and not beholden to others uh, strategically. But yeah, of course, on Taiwan were... Uh, were controversial because they they suggested that uh, Europe Europe was not going to be there to to support Taiwan in the event of a, a Chinese invasion and that caused a lot of anxiety on on both sides of the Atlantic 
but I think it's, to some extent, it's Macron being Macron. He's speaking, he was almost speaking off the cuff, I had the impression. And then when you look at what the, the French official position is, when you, what the, the French ambassador to, the, to, the, or to Washington was saying, they seem to, to take a much more sort of conventional European line, I think, that by saying we are, you know, we're not equidistant between the US and China, the US is our ally, of course, we, we share democratic standards. Uh, and, and certainly not not being as uh, not sort of leaving Taiwan hanging out to dry as Macron a- appeared to do in his in his interview. So I think it was another example of where he's he's speaking in this very sort of uh, almost like a sort of think tanky way about how he sees the world without weighing every word and and how those words will be read by all his counterparts in Europe and by by people elsewhere. Do you think that's a huge issue for the EU when a, when you've got a second term French president like that? that can make those kind of comments. And also, do you think this Taiwan issue is now are going to be a huge geopolitical issue? Or is this just washing over because of the recent visit of the, the Taiwanese president to, to California and the, the European visit? Do, do you know what I mean? Is this, is this going to be the thing that we're talking about in the, in the coming six months? Well, I think China, I mean, China's future development and China's increasing descent into authoritarianism and human rights abuses is going to be a really dominant issue of course uh for for the whole world for 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 a long time to come and that's going to be a a, a big issue for europe as well uh, and taiwan taiwan specifically it's the, its status uh, as well and and i'm sure that and the chinese are watching what is happening in in ukraine to see what how that might affect their own foreign policy choices in in future, so inevitably it's a it's a big issue for Europe and um, and I think there will be different. We're going to continue to see different views from from different European capitals, including today from, for example, the Ger- the German foreign minister who is also on her way to or in Beijing. Uh, and now apparently feels her task is more complicated by having to you know define what is the German position following what Macron has said uh, in the last few days. Yeah, on that, without one single leader of the European Union or the European project, is it wise to have all of these ministers, leaders, etc, traipsing through Beijing trying to give different messages. Do you think China gets the same message from Europe from all of these from all of these figures that have been going in there? We saw the Spanish Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, Olaf Scholz not too recently, the German Chancellor was in there too. I suppose for, for any foreign government, especially an authoritarian one, there, there will always be a desire to divide and rule, to, to, to emphasise, to accentuate the splits that they find within the EU. And clearly it would be, it would make a lot of sense if the EU could find one voice to speak with on the world stage. But it's very difficult to see how that's going to happen in, in reality when when there are, each each member state comes to the, the European Union with its own very different history with, and on sometimes of, often different views on the world. So I think this is, is not going to be an issue that can be easily sort of ironed away through having lots of declarations. We, on the, the, the war in Ukraine, you can see actually a, a lot of unity, um, unity to the extent that that has surprised even EU EU officials, but I think that doesn't uh, that's not necessarily going to carry over to every foreign policy question when you have governments in the EU as diverse as as, as Belgium and Hungary to, to pick an example. Yeah, Jennifer, thanks so much for joining the show today. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you.